Good afternoon, guys. Today, this is the lecture for chapter seven, the energy of a system. I will be going over work and energy, kinetic, potential, and potential elastic. I will show you Hooke's law. And then we will be doing, uh, oh, in the next video, I will be showing you guys a few uh, applications, problems, and then you will do, as always, you will have the web assigned tutorial. Um, if you guys check the slides from chapter seven, I just want to introduce very quickly what's the concept of work, which we are going to understand define as the change on energy of a system, okay? So if the energy is not being changed, then the work done by any for by the, the force in this case will be zero. Uh, something that we have to also uh, define in this chapter is the idea of a conservative force. A conservative force is a force that uh, applies or exerts some work that is independent of the path that the object is following. Because as you can see from the equation, that work is defined as the force times that displacement. So we have the cosine there, because if you think about it, when you have a mass, you can, and we have done this in a previous chapter in Newton's laws, if you're giving a, if you're giving a mass, you can apply any force, but in this case, it can be a force with some angle theta respect to the horizontal. So if I disregard friction for now, and I say this moves a distance delta r, uh, displacement, sorry, delta r, then we define the work of this constant force as the force times delta r times cosine theta. Because what happens is that you break the force into two components. You have this component and you have this component, right? And you know from vectors, this, was, this is f cosine theta and this is f sine theta. So since the object is only moving horizontally, only this force is applying some work on the object, okay? But remember, that is the algebraic definition of work and it's only when the force is constant, all right? If the object is not moving, let's say you are leaning towards a wall and you are exerting some force, then you are not applying any work. If I try to move this desk and I, not, and I don't move it, the work is zero. Now that's interesting. So the units of work are joules, Newton's per meter, Newton's times meter or Newton's meter is defined as joules. Kilograms, meter squared per second squared. That would be the dimensional analysis. So that's uh, important. So remember that the force that does work in this situation is a horizontal work force. The vertical force, if the object is not being lift, it doesn't do, it doesn't produce any work. So just like energy, work is transfer. The best way to picture this is by having two masses next to each other. If you push one mass, the other one will move. So you are exerting some work on that other mass from the work you are exerting to the other mass that you are pushing, right? When you have the system of masses, in that case, I'm showing those bills, but instead of just having one mass, I can give you here another one. And it makes sense with the idea of energy, right? That you probably are that you probably know already. So this is M2, M1. If I apply a force 
This system will move to the right. Uh, so the system is moving, that means that this mass is moving, this mass is moving. So M1, there's a work on one, which is being transferred to two, so there's work on two. All right, the distance may be the same, the work may be different, all right? And that has to do with the conservation of energy that we're gonna discuss and the work energy theory. Okay, so a change of energy is due to an external force acting on a mass, okay? So that's important to start sort of understanding, all right? A very important force that we are going to discuss is the gravitational force. The gravitational force is the one responsible for the planets to go around the sun. So this force is conservative. So even though the sun goes around the, uh, the sun, the air goes around the sun in an elliptical fashion, well, let's assume it's circular, it doesn't matter, that force exerts zero work. Now you're probably thinking, but it's moving. Yeah, but it's moving in a period, in a, cir in a circular fashion, right? And what we know is that the energy, and then later we're gonna discuss the momentum, that angular momentum is being conserved. So if the energy is being conserved, that work is independent of path. So in a closed path, that work is zero, all right? So work can also be negative. And that's because you can have a negative force, you can have a negative vector. It's just, by the way, work is a scalar, all right? But we can define the work done by friction, for example, as a negative work, because this work is slowing down an object. If you throw a ball and it stops, due to the friction between the floor and the ball, that work done by the friction is negative. So in this picture here, the largest amount of work will be when the angle between the force and the displacement is zero. That will be in Kc. If we use the mass, cosine of zero is zero. When is the cosine the lowest value, the cosine of pi? the cosine of 180 is negative one. That will be the lowest in terms of like uh, direction, right? And in terms of the magnitude, no magnitude, sorry. In terms of the direction of the force, that will give you the most negative work. That will be B. So in between are A and D. A is zero work because the object is moving to the right, but the force you are, you are applying is up. You're probably wondering how come it doesn't go up because the force is probably lower than the force of gravity acting on the mass, okay? Um, yep. So there you are, right? C, zero, negative already, but not as negative as this. So CADB, right? They're asking you to organize the work from most positive to most negative. So that's why. And then here is an is a problem or, or an example, not a problem, of how we use the definition of work. All right. Um, okay. So let's start talking about these vectors because we have displacement and force, and somehow we are getting a scalar. That's because of the definition of dot product. When we define work, work we are defining work as the dot product of the force dot delta A. Let's just leave it like that. So let's assume they are parallel. Cosine zero is one. So in general, we can have the dot product of vectors. 
which you can define as vector a dot vector b. The dot product of vectors give you a scalar. The way we sort of can picture this is if you are having two vectors at some angle, let's say theta, and you somehow somehow we are going to project this vector here. This is like a graphic definition of that. So then we have this to be a cosine theta. All right, on the same direction as, as B. So when they are like that, then we can define the dot product from that picture. Uh, we can say that A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine. All right. So if you think about it, now you know more explicitly, mathematically speaking, where the cosine theta happens to show or why does it show? From the definition of work, but from the math. So there are a few problems where I'm gonna ask you to find, let's just practice how do you find angles between vectors and the dot product of vectors. So as you know already, we can write vectors in their uh, components, right? So let's write this again. I'm gonna give you a vector A. Let's say this is free I minus five J. And I'm going to multiply with a vector B, which is minus i plus 6j. If I want to do that dot product between these vectors, you can write this vector like this, 3 comma negative 5 for minus 5 dot minus 1 comma 6. So here, three times negative one is minus three plus minus five times six is minus 30. That will be minus 33. That's where the scalar comes from, right? So awesome. That's how I can multiply two vectors. Now, from here, I can also tell you that if you're multiplying the unit vector i dot unit vector i, that is equal to one. The same happens with j, and the same happens with k. Remember, k is the unit vector for the c-axis. All right. What about the angle between vectors? So we're going to use that information then. I have the vectors. I want to know the angle between these two. Using the dot product, uh, I just use the definition of dot product. You know, dot product is. Magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine of the angle in between. We know that. So let's use this space here now.
and then I will just use that um, that dot product is minus 33 is equal to the magnitude of A. That's the square root of 9 plus 25. That's the square root of 34. Times the magnitude of B, 1 squared, 6 squared, the square root of 37. Times the cosine of the angle in between. So as you can see, we're going to get a negative cosine. That means it has to be either in the second or third quadrant. Well, let's take a look. Uh, this is 5.83 approximately. Let's put here the multiplication. Uh, 6.04. All right. Okay, so minus 33 divided by 5.83. So it's gonna be an approximation, right? Minus 0.93, that's what I get for the cosine. And now if I do an inverse cosine, I get 158.6. That's the angle in between. Makes sense. That's the second quadrant. All right. Um, so that's what you come in the slides. You have that. Obviously, if the vectors are perpendicular, the cosine of 90 is zero. If the vectors are parallel, it's just a b. If the vectors are opposite directions, then you have negative because the cosine of 180 is minus one. We have all this. You can avoid this for now. It's fine. It's an example, and I want to use it on the board. The angle in between. Okay. So that's why we use this, right? If I give you the position as a vector or the displacement. And the force as a vector, you can just apply what we just did on dot product to find the work done by that force. Remember, force is a vector, displacement is a vector, so you can just use that and you get the answer. Remember, the work is in joules. Okay. All right, guys. So let's go to a bit of calculus now. So, <laughs> Obviously, a force is always constant. You can have a varying force. So in the X and Y axis, I'm going to draw a picture that you can probably have seen in calc already. If you haven't, make sure you pay attention. So I'm going to say that this is the displacement and this actually is going to be my force. This is my force in newtons, and this is my displacement in meters. So I'm going to have a force varying with time and distance from point A to point B. To find the work, we have defined that work is the F dot delta A. But my displacements are very large, especially if I want to do infinitesimal division, because since the, since the work is varying with time, with distance, then I'm going to have here a very small division, a partition per se, right? Delta X. So I can find this, this is, so this is a function. 
you read a function on this point x, right? So this is a function f of x. So if this is a point x, for example, this is f of x. So that's a force. So we can say that the differential of what is equal to f of x times differential of x. The total work from A to B is the total area. The area under a curve is defined as the integral. So I basically can just integrate on both. And I have that the work from A to B is equal to the integral from A to B of the force dot dx. Where this force can be a function of x or x, y. All right. So this is the explicit or analytical definition of work. So that's interesting, right? Because we can actually now expand our knowledge into what we can do with a, with a force. I wanna give you first a very easy example. Remember that this is the area under the curve. So one of the problems that you will have also similarly in the web assign is if they give you, and you will probably have this on a quiz or in the exam, if you are giving a plot where you have the displacement in meters and again the force in newtons, and you have that the force is constant for a bit. But then it goes all the way down like that. This point is obviously the origin. This is four, this is six. And the value of the force is five. And they want you to find the work done by the force from zero to six. If we, we can even, look, we are not given the value of the force here. Now, clearly in this section here, the force is constant, you move four meters. So in this section here, this work is equal to five times four, 20 units. Positive because the force is positive. What about in this section, this triangle, the force is changing. You can also find the area, but now it's the area of a triangle. This is five, this is two, five times two is 10, but because it's a triangle divided by two, five units. So the total work, you put here the work from zero to six is equal to 25 units. Just the area under the cube. All right, so that's easy. And you can also do it between any intervals of distance, by the way. Okay, I'm going to go and use this equation, guys, because there are ways to find the work done by different objects moving either horizontally, uh, falling down, or in a spring. 
we are going to start talking about the mass spring system, which later we're going to talk about oscillations and simple harmonic motion. But let's show you what are the parameters of an oscillating system. We're going to use for convenience a mass spring system that is horizontal. So we don't have to worry about the gravitational force. What you are seeing right now is an object that I'm going to stretch. And then the spring, as you will expect, it will be a stretch. from what we call the equilibrium position. This is the equilibrium position. When I do that, the object will go and start oscillating. Again, we are, dis we are disregarding friction. What we know is that this is called the stretch delta x. This is called the natural length. So every spring in the lab has a natural length. When you stretch or compress the spring some distance delta x, the object will feel a restoring force. That restoring force was studied by Hook. Uh, not Hook like Peter Pan, no, but Hook, the physicist or mathematician who realized that there was a restoring force. on the negative direction. So he said that this force is proportional to a constant K, which is the stiffness of the spring. And we know that the units of K are in Newtons per meter. So what is this restoring force? Let's call this F. Uh, F of the spring, Fs. So Fs, let's put here Hooke's law. We find the force on the spring to be minus K So obviously, I can do an infinitesimal division here, right? You're probably already thinking that. I'll put it here. What will we get? We will get the work. But what's work? The change of energy. So I know this is odd, but I'm going to show you right now the equation for potential elastic energy, which is the work done by the hook slope, by the restoring force. So if I apply that force into this equation here, the work done by the spring, uh, yeah, let's put that, will be the integral of minus k x, I'm going to put minus kx, through a infinitesimal division from point A to point B. Or you can just say from A, from zero, the equilibrium position to a point x5. Minus k is a constant, x dx. So at the end of the day, I'm going to integrate 
right? You've seen that there. So this one is one half x squared. So I get here actually from x to zero. That was my mistake. <laughs> from x final to the equilibrium position. One half k x squared. I got the formula for the work done by the spring, which also is known as the potential elastic energy. And in the slides, they show you that actually. There you are. So, in general form, you can go from initial to final, right? And you get that. Uh, yeah, that's the same. Let's go into vertically. Now you have to worry in, this, in the vertical case, you have to worry about the force of gravity. So the elongation, there you are. Um, if the mass is placed and then you leave it at rest, then the restoring force is equal in this case, right? The restoring force goes upwards and the weight goes downwards. So mg is equal to the restoring force. So that's what they use here. Okay. That's easy. Yeah. Okay. Let's go into kinetic and potential. So we know that when we talk about kinetic, we always talk about objects in motion. We have seen already an example of an object in a spring mass in a spring mass system, and uh, it works out very nicely. So now let's study what happens when a generic force is acting on a body, and I am exerting some work. We know from Newton's second law that forces divide as mass times acceleration. We're gonna use a definition and this formula or this definition of work to find the kinetic energy or the change of kinetic energy. And then we're gonna use the force of gravity to find the change of potential energy. And with that, we are gonna be defining the energy of the system, all right? So, not many problems today. I will do those next class or next video, but this is a nice introductory video for this, right? All right. And it's gonna be important for chapter A when we do conservation of energy. So chapter A is gonna be more problem-based video for conservation of energy and uh, work in the theorem, okay? And also momentum. That's what I'm talking about momentum. So we we'll start talking about that. So chapter eight and nine, seven, eight and nine are very important. All right, we need to get through that. So then we can start talking about rotational energy and objects. So let's start with the, uh, I'm not gonna draw the mass. You know what I mean? I'm going to give you a force on the X direction, which is M times the acceleration on X. And I'm gonna use my definition of work. So work due to the force X is equal to the integral from position initial to position final of mass times acceleration on X, dX. Um, mass is constant. And I'm left with the 
I'm left with this. What is the definition of acceleration? On X, at least, is the first derivative of position respect of time. Sorry, velocity. So, hmm. well, I have the DDT, it's a function of time, respect to X. And look at this. What is the XDT? The XDT is velocity of X. So I have what I want, right? But because I'm changing the variable, I'm also changing my limits. You will see more of this explicitly in calculus when you do the change on variable. All right, but that makes sense. You're changing the limits now because now the derivative, now the integral is respect to V. The way you think you can think about it is, um, think as, the acceleration as a function of x as the chain rule of the derivative of velocity respect to x times the derivative of x respect of time. So we know that this is velocity and we can multiply by dx on both sides and I get a dx, which I had here, equals to v dd. I think it's like that. So we have use all that. If I integrate that, and V dV, I already showed you that integral is one half of mass V squared from V initial to V final, which gives me one half mass V final squared minus the initial square. Well, guys, this is the definition of kinetic energy. Change of kinetic energy. So we have used the equation for work to prove that work is a change of energy. Right? We have done that. That's awesome. Now, can you do this in general? Yes. You could put here dr, and then just do, instead of dv dt will be, or dv dt will be the same, this will be dr, right? And dr dt is that, so you can do it in general. I just did here on the x-axis, it works in general as well. For objects falling, and without we finish this video lecture, all right? We will do the problems next. Well, you will see it right now because I will be uploading both videos simultaneously. So you don't have to wait. For an object falling due to gravity, you have the force of gravity going down. So if this is the ground, let's say that that's gonna travel some distance delta y or some distance y. This is initial, this is final. We can put that the force due to gravity is minus mg. 
minus comes from this, right? Gravity is negative, negative 9.8. The definition of work is telling us that from position Y to position zero, from the very top to the bottom, minus mg, not dx, because now you're in a vertical, y. It's a much easier integral, right? Minus mg, y, from y to zero. Well, as you're probably thinking, the work done by the gravitational force is just mg, y, or mgh. This, guys, is the potential energy. The energy stored due to an object that is at some height respect to the ground. So for potential energy, we need to define points of reference. It's different as if you have your point of reference even down. For example, and with this, we'll, we'll, we'll be finished. Respect to the ground, everybody has zero potential energy. Technically, that's not true, though, because we are on the surface of the Earth. And you know that the Earth has a radius. So technically speaking, for a person here, 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 they have a potential energy respect to the center of the planet. What we say is that it's zero on the ground because we have set the ground as your zero point of reference. So any rocket or any satellite orbiting the Earth has some sort of potential energy and also kinetic as it orbits the Earth. Uh, both are conserved, by the way, as it goes around. Just like, for example, the energy of the planet is being conserved as it goes around the sun. So obviously now is the time or in the next video, we will combine some of these concepts, right? So this was kinetic and um, yeah. So now the next class, we're gonna be doing more of these examples, all right? So that's what you're gonna see in the next video. Let me just see here. Yeah, here's the potential one. And I want you guys to combine both to start working on the wave side. All right, guys. So I'll see you guys, for some of you, just in a couple of minutes on the video for problems and examples on chapter uh, seven. See you later.